Well, I started up with a beat, and like I say, this is one of those things that made me kind of feel cool, but uh, I started to, the little beat there that they play on that, and old Dickie Betts, he, he looked over at me and goes, but <laughs> to give you the improvement, he can say, he said, That's yeah, it. yeah. That's I said, right. Oh man, I want to jump off my drums and just go hug him, you know, <laughs> which would have messed up the song. But you know. <laughs> something in the water told me how to crawl. Something in the water told me how to fall. Hey, hey, we're here with another episode of Something in the Water, brought to you by Caution Light Media. I'm one of your hosts, Sean Clark, and I'm Uncle Dave Griffin, and our guest this week is my dear, dear friend, old childhood buddy, music buddy, life buddy, we've been through it all, Mr. John Randall Smith. From White Cross, Georgia. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to be here, guys. <laughs> Me and John go back a long, long ways. Uh, I reckon uh, music brought us together to begin with. And uh, uh, we've had many, many moments. We've shared many stages and had uh, uh, many uh, escapades in life. Uh I think, uh, first off, I just want to start by saying this hat that I'm wearing means a lot to me, and it was given to me by this man sitting right here after his daddy passed away. His daddy was the, uh, if there was ever a Renaissance man, he his daddy was. His daddy was uh, Judge Ben Smith, Jr., and uh, following a long line of of uh, of Smiths, um, his daddy uh, flew Air Force missions over Germany in World War II. He lived through that, came home, and uh, um, he became a lawyer. Uh, he's a fantastic graphic artist, paints, oils, canvas, all of that stuff, just... Uh, <laughs> unbelievable folk art uh he's an author wrote a wonderful book uh, of his exploits in world war ii called chick's crew and uh sadly he passed away uh probably about eight nine years ago maybe I'm 2014 not, 2014 mm -hmm. okay and it was about uh sometime after he passed away my front doorbell rang, and there was John standing outside with this hat, which I recognized immediately. And uh, he was saying, I just thought I'd ask you, did you want Daddy's hat? And I was shocked. I said, uh, there's many, many men in your family. I said, why me? He said, well, Daddy would like you to have it besides we got the big head. <laughs> no, he says it won't fit any of us. And I accepted it, uh, graciously and lovingly. And because his daddy meant a lot to me too. He loved you too. And, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm looking to, uh, find a hat shop somewhere. If, if any y'all know some, uh, email us at, something in the water podcast at gmail.com and, and let me know or comment down below. Let me know of a good hat shop somewhere that'll clean it and re uh, reband it and uh, shape it and all that kind of stuff. I really want this hat back in pristine condition. So saying all that, that kind of gives you a clue as to, as, as to the daddy of this man was, he was a great man and he had a, a lot of great, uh, children and John's just one of them. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of your daddy and mama, they're both beautiful people. I got to know them in, in life. They, y'all all grew up here in Wake Cross. Tell us a little bit about your, your, your life growing up in Cherokee Heights. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we started out first thing I remember is on Euclid Avenue, the 1212 Euclid Avenue. And uh, 
we uh, lived there when I was a little boy. And they moved that house now over by way across the middle school somewhere. Yeah. And then we, we bought Dr. Calhoun's house. Dr. Calhoun was a local doctor and our doctor. And uh, so that was first grade uh, <laughs> when we moved to Oconee Road. Okay. which is where my parents stayed until till their end. And uh, I live on Oconee Road right now, so I was always uh, – it was good to live close to yeah. them, and especially in and that the house, years. Uh, that house of Dr. Calhoun's uh, was the Spanish style. Well, right? Daddy, Daddy made it more Spanish. Daddy did. It was more uh, of a, like a cinder okay. block house, but Daddy added the Spanish wall and okay. and all the doors and stuff because he loved Mexico. He spoke yeah. Spanish. They used to have a Spanish club, and <laughs> and he, he he got some some lanterns, you know, from Germany, and they look Spanish though. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, he he kind of made gave it that Latin look. You oh, know? Okay. He was very artistic, of course. Yeah. And uh, he was he could he could do anything make doors. Those doors are still there on that house. And then later on, they uh, bricked the house and they bricked it up with the old bricks that were on the YMCA downtown that they tore oh, down. Awesome. So they bricked it up yeah. with those bricks. But wow. neat. But uh, I have two brothers and a sister, Ben the third and Bill, who's a very good musician. Of course, he played in bands with us, and yeah. uh, and my sister, who's a very talented artist, and. Uh, and our parents were uh, now we had a we had a we had just a, our house was, was crazy wild <laughs> fun uh, nutty as hell sometimes but it was never boring <laughs> it's just boredom is it's never been a concept that I can relate to I don't think I've ever been bored yeah, I just get up in my mind and start imagining things that's how you deal with that but I really can't relate to boredom but. Uh, but thank God, you know, Daddy and, and Mama, they they taught us that concept of carpe diem, you know, enjoy your life while you can. Uh -huh. And, and uh, of course, I ended up being an English teacher, and that was yeah. one of my big themes, you know, trying to get these students to seize the day and, yeah. and make the most out of life. And A well-loved English teacher, too, mm -hmm. I might add. He, uh, a lot of the kids have... Uh, uh, have all given props to you over the years. My cousin Brandon Doty and a friend John Pope, yeah. who, who ended up being in a band with me, it, it's their senior year, and uh, yeah. they they loved you. I think you were their favorite teacher. Well, they were my daughter Carmen's good friends, yeah. the best of friends. Now John Pope went to England mm -hmm. with a group of students I took over there, and Brandon went to Italy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Switzerland and Paris with us. We did a couple of trips over there, and and uh, yeah, great, great guys, both of them. <clears throat> well, uh, getting back to the uh, the house uh, on Oconee that used to belong to Dr. Calhoun. That's an interesting little story of how that transaction came to came to pass. Yep. Tell that uh, story about how you, you, your daddy and Dr. Calhoun struck a deal. They just struck a deal, I guess. <laughs> well, they, 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 wasn't they, no money they were involved, both right? okay with what? Well, no, he ended up with the the lot uh, at 1212 at the corner where Vicki Calhoun lived for years. They built that brown house there on that corner there. And uh, so there was a swap of properties. And. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, Vicky on that land all the way down there to the canal and all, and and Doctor Bill, she she had one of the coolest cars in the world. It was a, it was a very uh, rare uh, vehicle. It was a, a Corvette Stingray. Mm. The first year they called them Stingrays. It was automatic, and the first one, well, not the first one, but one of just a few that had air conditioning, factory air conditioning, and one night. Uh, Bill Calhoun and Vicky and, and and my mom and daddy went to Jacksonville and he uh, he should have thought better, but he gave my brother Ben the car the car keys to that Corvette. <laughs> that Corvette man, we raised hell in Cherokee Heights. We went way too fast, <laughs> and but it was fun. And uh, Bill was maybe Evelyn, but I had to sit in the little <laughs> middle there. But we had some fun in that car. But I saw that car on. The internet not long ago talking about how rare that car was but wow but um yeah, so, they, so uh 
I was always under the impression that they that they traded houses for and and one of them paid the other one a dollar or something like that. But I thought that y'all got his house, the Spanish style, that ended up the Spanish style house, and he got y'all's Euclid. That wasn't the way it worked. Well, they got the property. Now, the house was moved later on, so I, I was pretty young back then. I was So like, your daddy got the property where that house sits? Is that what it is? Well, Bill Calhoun, you're talking about, yeah, it, that was Bill Calhoun got that property. Hmm. Yeah, he was he was our family doctor. He was a good guy. He was a, a good doctor, too. Yeah. But, yeah, what, going back to Daddy, you mentioned a lot about yeah. Daddy's the one that got us into music. Uh, he uh, he always kept the stereo going. Now, he loved every kind of music, and I'm grateful for that because he taught us to love all kinds of music. Mm -hmm. He played opera, uh, uh, whatever. He he played uh, Dixieland jazz, Kid yeah. Ori on the trombone, and. And he loved Bill Monroe and and, and the, the, the Stanley Brothers, mm. uh, bluegrass, big he, band, he, big band. They loved big band. He and Mama, they fell in love because they decided to get married because they could dance well together. Oh. I guess that's as good a reason as anybody <laughs> as anything's what he used to say. But uh, <laughs> he met her. She was one of the Victory Girls down at Avon Park, Florida, and, and they struck it up and they. He saw her on the dance floor cutting a rug, and he just said, I got to get in on that. So he liked to dance, too, because you remember at our gigs, he'd be out there dancing and beating his leg to death with a tambourine. But, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah, we were – But he loved all kinds of music, R&B, uh, rock and roll. Uh, uh, he loved Wilson Pickett because he, he just loved that scream and Wilson mm -hmm. screams like a panther, ah, you know. And <laughs> but he they took us to concerts. Uh, they took us to see uh, Hendrix, Jimmy. Yeah. Well, I was gonna get to that in a second, yeah. but we start out we go see James Brown and yeah. and his band and uh, and uh, hardest working man in show business. And yeah. you know we we were, there were not a lot of white people in the audience, but. That that never mattered to Daddy, you know. Uh, he, he didn't see color or anything like that. And uh, Jacksonville, Jacksonville Coliseum. He raised he raised us right though, and uh, on music and a lot of other ways too. Uh, he we saw the four tops. I remember one time we were supposed to go see the Georgia Florida game, but it was raining. Uh, tarts, cats and dogs, and. Uh, and he didn't want to drag his family out there. We probably didn't have any business there anyway. A bunch of, <laughs> you know, the world's largest cocktail party. But Back in them days. We looked in the paper and the Four Tops were playing that night. He said, we'll go see the Four Tops. So we went and saw the Four Tops. And, <laughs> Instead of Georgia, Florida. Yeah, that was, well, which was, we much wanted to see the Four Tops <laughs> yeah, better because we played Reach Out and, and all those songs. And the Spinners were on the same ticket. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, I guess one of the coolest things he did, uh, he uh, he and Mama took the high school band, the Waycross High School band, to see the Jimi Hendrix Experience. Uh, wow! And uh, of course, of course, all the people in the band thought Mom and Daddy were cool as all get out, you know, <laughs> taking them to see Jimi Hendrix. And uh, you know, it's kind of wild. We were all kind of young and naive, and we looked over there and we saw these people. And we're like, I think they're smoking pot over there, you know. <laughs> About a year later, everybody in the whole Coliseum was smoking pot. But, uh, but, uh, and then when they went to see uh, uh, the band played with the uh, halftime show for the Washington Redskins and New York Giants, they went up there on a train. Mom and Daddy were chaperones, and they took them out to see the Love and Spoonful in Washington, wow. D.C. Some of the parents didn't think that was a good idea, but mom and daddy thought it was a great idea. You yeah. know, let's have some fun. That was their motto. But, mm -hmm. but my music start probably started where yours and a lot of other people you've had on here seeing the Beatles come yeah. on the Ed Sullivan show Sunday night. It's the old story. Yeah. You know, and the music was so fresh. Now and, I was 10 when that happened. You were, you were born in 55. 55. So yep. you'd been eight when it, yep. when it happened. I've been uh, listening to an audio book by 
the guitar player from Toto, Steve Lukather. Mm -hmm. Monster. He is. He was a great, great, great artist. But uh, his story is the same. But he was only six, mm -hmm. six years old when and he saw the Beatles on, on Ed you know, Sullivan. And you just were told that the whole. But the whole but life. like some like things a are lot very of, impressionable. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people were that into it that uh, that made that same pronouncement. They said, "That's what I want to do with my life." I didn't make that mm -hmm. call that day. You know, I enjoyed it, but I. Uh, I, I didn't come to that conclusion like so many did. Did you? Did you sit there and say, I need to be like Ringo or what? Well, I, I just loved everything about it. I think one thing I really like is, I, I ain't going to lie, those girls screaming. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, now, I want that kind yeah. of attention, you know. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Never got it, but, you know, on, on that scale anyway. But uh, I've never had yeah. I know never – no one has fainted <laughs> over me, you know. Uh, but just the music and yeah. just the whole Beatlemania, I got caught up in it. You, know, you mm -hmm. get the lunch boxes and everything that was going along. And and so uh, my brother Bill was, was hit like that too. And mm -hmm. so we said, hey, we got to start a band, just like mm -hmm. all these garage bands. And uh, um we were we were downtown Waycross. It's where the pick and save used to be. Now it's St. Vincent's. Mm -hmm. But it used to be a grocery store called Setzer's. That's right. And it it, it faced the side road there now. Mm -hmm. And my daddy was big into politics and he uh he uh put us out to campaign to hand out flyers for Carl Sanders, who was running for governor. Yep. Daddy was head of the Ware County Democratic Party. And this would have been 64, I guess. Something, yeah, probably something like that. And uh, so he comes to pick us up, and uh, we're just, you know, helping out and doing our duty, wasn't expecting anything. And we, he said, I got something for y'all. <laughs> and he, in the back seat was a Gibson, uh, I want to say Hawk. Bill might correct me. It's either, either Gibson Hawk or Gibson Falcon amplifier, and two Hagstrom guitars. Mm. <laughs> I had a Hagstrom one, a red one, and Bill had a Hagstrom two mm -hmm. guitar. I guess they still make them, do they? Uh, I think I so. Hagstrom. They look kind of like Fenders, but anyhow, yeah. they bought them from Billy Harrell. And that's a whole other podcast right there, that's, Billy uh, Harrell. That was but, the local music store yeah. in Waycross, Harrell's Music Store on Tebow Street. That's where we all got our yep. guitar strings and, and instruments and all. But we freaked out. We went straight home, and we couldn't. We were just overjoyed. And we went home, plugged them in. And and I remember they were loud as hell. I mean, <laughs> that, I, just, I wasn't used to that kind of volume, you know, even seeing the Beatles and all. Of course, you couldn't hear much of them on account of the screaming, but <laughs> but uh, so we got a band up, and it's my first band. It's called Mother's Little Helpers. I, my mama may have given us that name, <laughs> and uh, it was me, Bill, and Charles Lee. He was the local sheriff's son, Robert Lee, and uh, and before that, though, uh, uh, we went and saw this other band. They were called the Wandering Souls. And they they and uh, this is a cool part of the story because I know you're a big Grand Parsons fan, but that's mm -hmm. where I was first exposed to music was in Grand Parsons' house where he lived in Waycross. That was Dr. That, Calhoun's house. No, this is no. on Swanee Drive, the house oh, oh, that yeah, they oh, moved out there to the museum. Yeah, that's so right. We that's saw right. the Wandering Souls and we saw a live band. Now Robert yeah. Lee played the drums, Larry Murray. Uh, 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 Dwayne Scurry's brother, uh, what was this? Golly. Anyhow, we, we saw them, and uh, uh -huh. Randy Hurst got killed in Vietnam. He played the rhythm guitar, and they would go down and play at Fernadina down there at the little corner club down by, down from Moore's, mm -hmm. the Golden Sands, I think mm -hmm. they called it. Were they playing at the house, or you saw them on they TV? Were, we saw them practicing there, Oh, and we just really got the bug then. And we said, well, we already got some drums because Charles can play Robert's drums. And Bill and I had two guitars. Mm -hmm. Well, we started the band. And uh, 
Bill and I were a lot more serious than Charles, and uh, we'd have call a practice, and he wouldn't be there, and he just was into other things more than playing music, and 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 we didn't have a drummer. And I said, "Well, Mom, we don't have a drummer." She said, well, "Why don't you play the drums?" I said, "But I don't have any drums." She said, "Well, Christmas is right around the corner," so <laughs> I started beating beats on my desk at Williams High School, learning how to play some beats. And Miss Garneto, my science teacher, she'd say, John, get off the drums. And I was back there just trying to learn the beats because I knew I was getting drums. Yeah. And uh, I kind of felt like I had a little bit of natural rhythm. And uh, yeah. and uh, and then uh, Bill Ferris joined us. He had an old Kent guitar. So we had three guitars. Yeah. And the Scurry Boy... He said, y'all need a bass. Y'all need a bass guitar. Well, oh, okay, you know. Lee. And Lee, Lee Scurry, Lee yeah. Scurry. yeah. And he, he said, I just happen to have one. <laughs> <laughs> and he's so uh, Ferris, this big old, it's like a Pontiac Bonneville. It was, it was a gigantic <laughs> bass guitar. It was a silver tone. Yeah. And we had a bass guitar. And Jimmy Sistar, uh, Rest in peace. He he had a little sort of his little fan organs, you know, yeah. cheap. And he got a real organ, got a Vox Jaguar. We wow. were on the road then. And uh we started practicing. We learned we were a top 40 band, we learned all the whatever was you know, we and it, this is what kept us playing a lot. We learned all the new songs, just like down home with Eddie Milton. We'd mm. learned all the brand new hits and people were, that's what they want to hear. So we and this was still Mother's Little Helpers. Well, by that by that, time. by that time we had we changed our name because Mother's Little Helpers sounded a little too kind of wimpy to yeah. us, and so we 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 tried to find a name. And Jimmy's neighbor Theo Davis, uh, she said, "Y'all should call y'all selves the faux pas." And we didn't know what it meant. Yeah. And my daddy said, "Well, that's French for like a social mistake yeah. or an error," you know. We said, well, I kind of like that. It's kind of cool, you know. The, the, faux, the faux pas. Yeah, the mm -hmm. faux pas, you know. And I am sure, still can't remember how we spell it. but uh, F-A-U-X-P-A-S. Yeah, but I, I can't remember if we had like faux and then P-A-S. Yeah. Or if, if it was like one word, but right. a capital and all. I just can't remember. I know that somebody misspelled it one time, called y'all the fox paws. Man, they called us every damn thing. They called us the four, <laughs> the four paws. <laughs> And then at the Battle of Bands in Jekyll Island, that we were called the Four Pawks, P A U X, <laughs> the Four Pawks. Now what? What's that? You know, that's yeah, not even yeah. a word. I don't think. I Maybe was, it is. But I was on a duo one time called Jangled Harp, and we went and played this thing in Dahlonega, Georgia, and they had us as the Mangled Hand. <laughs> <laughs> what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> <laughs> so I feel Jango Reinhardt yeah. uh, yeah. Jangled heart Mangled hand They, they just thinking uh, about Jango man, But you talking about and, they, and we'd have to spell it Pronounce it over, And we're like Why did We should have stayed With Mother's Little Helpers You know But, we, but, but you say Y'all won Y'all Or played in the uh, Battle of the Bands Well we played in uh, The first Battle of the Bands We didn't even play So we would just Get started And they mm -hmm. had it At different sections all over way across there was one stage on tebow street oh. and then at two o'clock the next band would be down at doughboy park and then yeah. it was like a, all over the city it's a pretty cool concept the only problem is they had to come up with a bunch of different pas and all but mm -hmm. but we uh we weren't you know we weren't seasoned and then later on we uh won the, the battle of the bands in way across and let's see the other bands that uh Let's see, second place was the Midnight Sun, which was Tony Cason's Black band. Shear. They, Black they, Shear, yeah. yeah, Bruce Wood, Bruce and Danny Wood. Bergsteiner, those guys. And third place was John Crichton's band, The Changing Times. Mm -hmm. Bill Pittman. Gene. Uh, Gene Sapp. Sapp. Who just yeah. had a 50th wedding anniversary. Good Way, Lord. To, he, go he Gene. My next, Way to go, Gene. Yeah, he's always been a big fan of all of our bands, you know, you t yours. And yeah. He's, yeah. He played, uh, he played uh, let's see. I think he played guitar, and he and, did. He and, played guitar, and John might have played the bass. But they, they were, they were, they came in third place. And honor, honorary mention was the long distance bicycle tire. That was Eric Nichols, <laughs> Kerry Swinehart. You remember Eric Nichols used to come in 
cross town all the time uh-uh. and just sit there and talk and talk and play <laughs> and, probably and look at books catalogs and order some strange stuff and all he I guess Eric, he's still around. I think. Yeah, he Eric was a cool guy, man. He, yeah. uh, they had an overhead projector like teachers use, and mm-hmm. then had these tie-dyed, they had these tie-dyed uh, uh, gel pieces yeah. of gel mm-hmm. like the teachers ride on, mm-hmm. and they did all these psychedelic things with an overhead mm-hmm. projector. You know, mm-hmm. had everybody tripping. You know, it was, it was, and that was mentioned in the paper about their. Uh, uh, exciting light show or something like that but, <laughs> honorable mention but um <laughs> you know before that we played at this the, the march of dimes thing at waycross high and i was in the fifth grade i started when i was nine i got my first set of drums when i was 10 and uh and i they had to get me out of school to go to Avery street to play for the the march of dimes the kids paid a dime to get in uh-huh. and they'd it was a fundraiser for the march of dimes and and we played monkeys, you know, I'm not your stepping stone and little black egg and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Man, the people were screaming, man, I, that's, that, I said, this is it. it. I love it. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, doing, I'm performing a service, you know. Tell us about them first, that first set of drums. What were they? They were Slingerlands. Uh-huh. Yeah, they were Slingerlands. And uh, I had a little tiny no smoking sign on the front. <laughs> I was against smoking. Later on, I started smoking like hell, but, but, um, uh, I wish I'd have brought those pictures. Uh, maybe we can post them up or something. I yeah. got two nice pictures that Big Jack Sistar took of us at different stages in the faux pas. But, uh, I sent some to uh, Justin for post-production. Okay, good deal, good deal. Yeah. But, uh, be the same ones, some with the, the, the Nehru shirts or the Indian, uh, what do they call them, Indian shirts? Dash, we had the Dashiki. Dashikis. They were African Dashiki the shirts, yeah. yeah. And then we had some silver uh, Nehru jackets. We all dressed the same in the faux pas. Mm-hmm. And our big main thing was hang tin t shirts. You remember yeah, the hang tins? Yeah, hang tins. Had the two footprints, yeah. surfers wore. Two little wore. feet mm-hmm. prints right there on you. And we wore white pants. Yeah. And those hang tins had all kind of colors. Mm-hmm. Then when we brand, because, you know, it's kind of a beach boy look, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, uh, but we all dressed the same. Now, our first manager was Jack Brinkley. <laughs> and he got us one gig, but I, I, and Jack knows how much I love him. He was a better performer than he was a manager. But he, <laughs> he just had a lot of, you know, he was playing music. He was in King David and the Slaves, too. Jack uh, is, is one of the, the, the Brinkley boys who uh, many of them played in the band from Scriven and uh, mm-hmm. Jessup area called uh, King David and the Slaves, a Wayne's, major yeah. band. That, they had a record. Yeah. Yep. Beach music group uh, that uh, fitted into our later musical lives. Uh, some of the members did, but the 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 probably one of the most important guys in that band was their lead singer by the name of Randall Bramley. Oh yeah. And who really went on to a great uh, uh, career. Uh, Play with Stevie Winwood. Yeah. Just about just everybody. A major major. Uh, musician, songwriter, journeyman. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. he's he's been around and done it all. He produced a session for us one time when he was living over there in Savannah. But uh, yeah, they had a, they had an outfit out and uh, a, a record out, and uh, so Jack Brinkley was y'all's manager briefly. There's one picture that I think uh, will show up right now. <laughs> now, uh, of of us of in the radio in the station, the WACL with radio station with yeah. Jack Brinkley at, at the microphone, just yeah. like I'm sitting here right now. Yeah, y'all and we're all, all scattered around, around, leaning on the equipment and all, yeah. looking at him, and he's probably telling y'all, "You're going to be the next Beatles." Well, he was <laughs> he was good. He's trying to teach us, you know, and he learned some steps. But he turned us on some good music like the Temptations, yeah. you know, uh, "Get Ready" and and. Uh, uh, but we weren't getting a lot of jobs and all, so my mama said, I'll manage y'all. Now, my mama was a good manager, mm-hmm. and she's just one of the kind of people that when she sets out to do something, it'd get done. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why Daddy loved her so much. She just had a lot of you know, know-how, and she mm-hmm. was good with people. But she managed us from 1965 to 1971, and she kept wow. us working. We played... Glencoe Naval Base, uh, 
Sea Island, uh, the Cloister, mm -hmm. uh, all those rich people, they, they got more money and put two piles, but they never played their band duly squat. But, <laughs> but uh, the Jenkins Street, some of your listeners will be, oh, I remember those days yeah. on Jenkins Street. In Wake Girls, yeah. They had this one couple, they won a dance contest every week. And the reason they won it, because everybody had gathered around, they get down on some dirty dancing now. <laughs> and I'm, this four, four dirty dancing came out, but it's, they, and I was just always, like eleven or twelve, looking at what are they doing, you know? Dirty but, dance has always been around. Yeah, yeah, it has. Yeah, I, I'm talking about the movie, you know. But uh, yeah. I, I, I was just a kid, and they'd have to feed me uh. M and M's to, to give me energy because I'd be over there wearing out, you know. Sugar rush. Yeah, and then Ben later on, my brother Ben, he says I got something better than that, and he got started feeding me no dose, you know, <laughs> caffeine pills, you know, and that, that did work better than M and M's. Uh, but those Jenkins Street uh, at American Legion, that's what I'm talking about over yeah. there by the water tower. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had some great times, you know. And then later on, the faux pas and mom. Mom, mostly, uh, we start bringing bands to Waycross. We we brought the Swing of Medallions to Waycross, and oh. they're playing coming up uh, uh, for uh, Swamp, Fest. Swamp Fest on the yeah. second, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this we played with the originals. We'd opened up their sets, yeah. got involved with Greg Haynes, yeah, who who, who was a promoter here, and, she, mm -hmm. and he and Mama became best friends. And they'd work with Bill Parker at WACL with the spots and everything, mm -hmm. and. We brought the Swing of the Danes, the Mayor, Vol and Wilder. We went downtown, me and Bill and Jimmy were in the paper with Daddy and the Mayor, yeah. declaring so-and-so day, Swing of the Danes day, and, <laughs> and uh, it was cool. All that stuff was just super exciting. It, you know, well, I, it was, I don't know. And it happened in a period, too, that was yeah. just one of the greatest decades, uh, not just because it was ours, but it just happened to be one of the Greatest decades, yeah, yeah, for music and change and oh, culture yeah. and everything, you know. One of the best bands that, that she brought, or that we brought, it's called a faux pas production. Was the Candymen? Oh my god! The Candymen back to Roy Orbison. Yep, and they were really, really good. And some of those guys, you know, got involved with Bill Lowry in and Atlanta. went on to become Atlanta Rhythm. Atlanta section. Rhythm Section. In fact, Rodney Justo sings for the present form of Atlanta Rhythm Section. Uh. Yeah, he was their singer before, yeah. you know, Ronnie Hammond. And now mm -hmm. he sings with uh, the Atlanta Rhythm Section. He had a great voice. They had some songs at Georgia Pines, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is a great song. And and uh, they uh, – the bad thing about that show was they played a set. Then we had to come on after their break, Ooh. and we didn't want to do it. I mean, it was just <laughs> – What were they uh, playing at the time? Oh, they were playing George Pine and those songs, but yeah. – the. The song that they opened up was "The Beatles Got to Get You Into My Life," <laughs> and it sounded probably Would, it sounded better than the brass? Beatles. They didn't wow. have brass. They didn't have band. it. They, they didn't need it. They they, they, they <laughs> probably played it on the keyboard or something. <laughs> yeah. But man, we were like, "Oh God, we got to go on now." Okay. <laughs> Mama, do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> That's where Mama said, <laughs> "Get out of here." <laughs> <laughs> but we we were just a little dinky band, and and uh, yeah, y'all were good. Y'all were cutting your teeth. Yeah, well, right there didn't didn't she have something to do with Lowry? Your mom? Yeah, yeah. We booked the Candyman through Bill Lowry talent. So I got a contract at my house. It. It's That's like right. Yeah, seven hundred dollars to bring the Candyman yeah. away across. Yeah. I got the contract sitting in and the folder. And they played at, my at house. the City Auditorium. Was yeah, City, City Auditorium, Auditorium, where we saw the box tops and all those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, pieces of eight swinging medallions. Uh, Detroit Wheels. Mitch Ryder, the yeah. Detroit Wheels, they showed they're, up. And then they're they, the ones that got their wheels yeah, slashed. Yeah, the Detroit Wheels got <laughs> slashed. <laughs> well, they, came, they had the number one song in the country, Devil with the Blue Dress on. Uh -huh. Charged the highest price that we've ever charged away across, $10. Mm -hmm. Played about 25, 30 minutes, said, we'll see y'all later. Now, people in Waycross wanted their money's worth, and so mm -hmm. they went out back and sliced up some of their bus tires. And so <laughs> they got Waycross. <laughs> they got Waycross. <laughs> and we were the cops yeah, were all back that. there, and we're like, "What's going on? This is this is high drama here, you know." And mm -hmm. but you know, they they did not give their money's worth to the people, and the people let them yeah. know about it, you know, mm -hmm. which 
which is I've always liked that about bands like the Eagles. They come out there and they get their people the money's worth. Yeah. Play yeah. three hours sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. Take a break, come out, play some more. So I've always appreciated those bands that just didn't have tiny short sets, you know. Yeah. Get, yeah. Get, give them what they paid for. But but we got, we we played in the Battle of Bands in in, in Brunswick, and uh, we came in second the first time. Then the second time we went over there, we won. And we talked to the judges, and they said, well, why, why did we win? You know, and the guy says, well, it was a toss-up, but when y'all played Stormy Monday Blues, mm. that old blues song that everybody mm -hmm. played, he said, that, that kicked it to y'all's court. And they were an older guy that liked the blues, and Bill Ferris used to sing the heck out of it. Yeah. And uh, so Stormy Monday Blues won us the Battle of the Bands over there at Jekyll. But, cool. Yep. What year was that then? About 67, 8? Or late 68, 69, maybe. So was it still faux pas? We were the faux pas to 71. Now the guys, we had a great long career. Mama kept us booked. We made money. Uh, we, uh, we were real popular around here. One time, uh, well, that's another band later on, but we, uh, but, uh, they went off to school. The older guys went off to mm -hmm. school and I was still in the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Bill went off to Troy State, my brother, and he came back. I guess he got kind of homesick and and uh, went to Val Austin. We put in together another band, and the name of that band was uh, let's see, well, I wrote it down. Was was Tribe? Mm -hmm. I remember Tribe. Ross P. Madison Darty. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a big band. Danny Yarber, who who's a local businessman, very talented keyboardist. Mm -hmm. uh, me on drums and. Uh, and Bill on guitar. And I remember seeing y'all in Monroe Park one afternoon. Y'all yep. <laughs> ran an extension cord or several extension cords from somebody's house. Becky my Reinbart's house. I just saw it the mm -hmm. other day. We were talking about it. I said, remember when we set up right there? And mm -hmm. where the yeah. playground is, you know. Yeah, and all and all the narcs were on the fringes watching us, you know. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was the days. Yeah. Yep. And there was a lot of narcs around. Yeah. But uh and I also saw y'all uh downtown at uh in front of the phoenix i believe yep right there on a flatbed that, truck up there is that uh confederate park isn't it yep and i don't i don't know the mm -hmm. occasion for that but i don't either but i remember sitting right there y'all had the phoenix at your back and was yeah. playing towards the park and we were all scattered across the street right there and, well uh, after we played one of those gigs we remember the city coffee shop yeah. We were starting to grow our hair long, mm -hmm. and we were sitting there, and we heard these guys. They kind of had old crew cuts and all, and mm -hmm. you know, and and uh, we just got through seeing Easy Rider where they shot, the, <laughs> you know, where they shot the guys on the motorcycles and killed them. Peter, and, and we were they were talking loud enough on, and one of them was like, uh, "I tell you what, you hold one, and I'll choke him and shoot him." Then I'll hold it over and you choke him and shoot him. And my <laughs> brother Bill was over there getting paranoid. He was like, we need to get out of here. Those guys are going to kill us. <laughs> you know, you remember those hamburger steaks? We were trying oh to scarf down God. our hamburger steak and get the hell out of there because we were thinking and, we were fixing to have easy riders. <laughs> you know, and, Those hamburger steaks and french fries were some of the best. Yeah, yeah. Too. So you wanted to take your time and eat them, but not that not night. Not that night. We were ready to get on out of there. We may not even finish, but. <laughs> but Thunder Rock uh, Tribe broke up and Ross yeah. and, and uh, Madison they went off and joined the band with uh, Jimmy Vining and Ronnie Griffin mm -hmm. and I forgot what they called themselves uh, but, local uh, they were still local yep yeah. so it was after that that's when we put together uh, Thunder Rock and that had eight people we just we uh, made a lot of noise and thought Thunder Rock was a good name and I, we might have played one gig. Dave Burns was in that. Yep. Danny Bergsteiner, he was killed in, in a car wreck coming mm -hmm. home from Georgia. John had two guitars, two drums, two keyboards, one lead singer, and one bass. So there were eight of us. And we practiced there in mom and daddy's foyer. It was God, loud. No. Eight it, pieces in, in the living room? Yep. Mm. And then after that, we started a band called Sugar Cane, and that was a – me, my brother Bill, Madison Dory on bass, and Johnny Davis, fine musician from 
from uh, St. Mary's, Georgia. Yeah. Really, really good lyricist. I like for Sean. You've heard some of his stuff. I don't know if Sean's heard of some of his stuff. You have but, because you played, shared a stage with him yeah. at Little Nights. It was the, probably the very first Graham Parsons yeah. guitar pool. Yeah, he played John by Davis, himself. Johnny Davis. He played his solo. He played a set. Uh, and uh, I got it on that little uh, CD. That little CD. Okay. Yeah. He's a fine <laughs> lyricist. I mean, Great he, guy, too. He, and he's very creative. And, mm -hmm. and uh, Sugar Cane broke up. And, and uh, you know, but that's that was kind of a turning point for me because – I got to some trouble with my parents. Uh, I got busted. They found something on me that I wasn't supposed to have. And they grounded me. <clears throat> and I couldn't go anywhere. And I went out there and the, in the, in the, in the, I'll just practice my drums. And that's when I started playing along with, with albums. Old cost headphones I was playing mm -hmm. with Derek and the Dominoes, Jim oh, Gordon, you know, boy. the best drummer of the day, and and just listening how they played and mm -hmm. how they didn't play too much, you know, and uh and he's all he's still one of my favorite drummers. He he's dead now, but and played along with the Almer brothers, you know, and I try to cover both parts, you know, they had two drummers and so that, I guess, that I guess, really served you well. Oh yeah, the the grounding is where I just said uh, that's kind of, you know mm -hmm. you you cross a point like you might realize in your songwriting where you say hey I'm getting pretty good at this mm -hmm. you know not being conceited just you realize that hey I, I might have crossed a the line there mm -hmm. where I can be more of a serious musician yeah. uh, I know Sean probably has experienced that too because I remember the first songs I wrote were horrible people would sit around and laugh at them and make fun of them it pissed me off. <laughs> <laughs> don't quit laughing at my song. Y'all start writing some if you don't, you know, if you, you don't like my song, start, you know, throwing a fit, you know, and they'd have come in comedy. I was trying, you know, I had some terrible songs, but, you know. Well, everybody has to go through yeah, that. Yeah, you have to go through. And, but, you know, you're out there, you're trying, you know, and, you know, your lyrics are real cliche. And, and uh, but uh, I guess we're going, going back to uh, uh, that point, uh, that that band eventually broke up and sugarcane. Yeah, now we added Bill Ferris to. Sh we were still sugarcane. Madison left. Right, right, right. And Bill Ferris played the bass, and we're that's the sugarcane that played at the Can Heat in, Centennial, in April of seventy four. Yeah, that in was Memorial Stadium right here in Waco. Yeah, yeah, we played with Can Heat, <laughs> and uh, me and Gibbo were sitting in the truck. Maybe another boy named Randy was with us also, but we were in the truck drinking up all their beer. I got they that, were wondering I got that where story the beer in was, my Tales you know? of the Week right here. It is it? <laughs> yeah. But it was uh, Randy. Uh, um, <laughs> we'll change the name to protect the innocent. You know? <laughs> yeah, we might not better go into all of that but that was uh, but you everybody he, knows Gibbo but you and he were in in the uh, equipment trailer yeah that had all of canned heats uh beer yeah and we got into and the beer drank a lot of it <laughs> yeah they want to know where it all went but uh we went out that night to the zodiac bar called George's but at that time it was the zodiac and I sat on the bar stool with old singer his name was bear bear Big yeah. Bear. And he was in the dumps now. His wife mm -hmm. was leaving him, and golly, I felt sorry for him, but he was, you know. Uh, he was crying in his beard. He was. Not, not even realizing that the man that was listening to his miseries <laughs> drank drank was beer. the one that had drunk all of his beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. Yeah. yeah, I remember reading that in your Tales yeah. of the Week. But, but Lord of mercy, so we... Sugarcane evolved into Space Gnome, and that was our crazy Frank. Space Day. Gnome. G-N-O-M-E. -E. -E, like the little garden guy Yeah, figure. the little, little extraterrestrial. I like that name the best so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We, we were wild now. We were, <laughs> we were irreverent one minute. We'd play a country rock. So I wrote a first song that was kind of good that I wrote mm -hmm. called Reflections. Oh, yeah. I've seen my reflections going by. But anyhow, we'd play a country rock song, then 
go into something very much like Frank Zappa. So we had an identity or, crisis. Original. Original. We started original band. Y'all, y'all yeah. wrote like Frank Zappa. Mountains of Madness, Telephone Poles. That had some obscene lyrics to it, but uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Happy Song. We had this one song. We were playing with Goose Creek Symphony. Remember them? Yeah, mm-hmm. Randall Brownlett was in that band. Mathis Auditorium. It was called Happy Song. Sing me a happy song. Sing it to the... I, I forget the words. That was y'all's? Yeah, it was our happy song. song. Yeah. and uh, But it sounded just like a Goose Creek song. Uh-huh. Johnny wrote it and said the guys from Goose Creek came out to the edge of the stage and just were staring at like like y'all stole their song. Like, that's our song, you know. Like, like when Pete Pete Towns got mad that Jimi Hendrix had stole his act, you know. You know, uh, that's our song, you know. And we played it anyway, but they they were crazy, man. One guy came riding down on a unicycle. I'm mean, about twelve feet street. off the ground. Yeah, between the amps on a unicycle. <laughs> yeah, they were very uh, different, but a fun band. Yeah. And we opened up with the Atlanta Rhythm <laughs> Section there. They they were terrible that night. Uh, they played at the college uh, gymnasium, and mm-hmm. I, they would they were not good that night. But they I think they were pretty messed up. You know, a lot of those guys got into recovery later on. You know, ha- they had to or die. You know, mm-hmm. but uh, we. Uh, so after- you were going to. Uh- I know Bill was going to college at B, at Valdosta mm-hmm. at the time, and uh, you were too, weren't you? I was pretending to go, <laughs> okay, okay uh, but I would go here and there. There was no know. aspirations at that point in time I to be an not, English teacher. You, I used to love academia <laughs> when I was a kid, but I got to college, and you know, you, when you have draft beer for a dollar and a quarter a pitcher, I mean, I was just a goner. You know? I did the same thing at my college. Yep, Georgia Southern, yeah. right? It was, wasn't good. Well, folk, uh, Space Gnome broke up, and a lot of them, on account of me, I was just too wild and crazy and irresponsible. And and, uh, and I, they kicked me out, and they disbanded, and I was kicked out of college, because I wasn't living up to Valdosta state standards. And back then they really didn't have any standards, but I wasn't living <laughs> up to them. <laughs> that tells you something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think all you had to do was write your name on the SAT back then and they'd let you in. But <laughs> but we had a – so I didn't know what to do. And I was mm-hmm. hanging out at my sister's house, driving her crazy. She's like, Mama, you got to come get him. You know? She was uh, living over she there. She lived too. over there going to school. yeah. yeah. And so I, I came home and and I had a I, I joined a little band called the Dover Buff Black Dover oh, Bluff yeah. Band Dover with Bluff. Bonnie yeah. and Bonnie and Belinda, Belinda. J- uh, George Bagley, Was Gerald Gibson, Gerald Gibson, and uh, and uh, we we didn't last very long. I think we played Branton County High School one prom or something, but and then we broke it. No, we didn't break up. It's when you guys came calling. Uh, this would have that's been 76. Yeah, and that's when yeah. you and I met up. Yeah, that was the first. Uh, now, we knew each other yeah, by this yeah. time. We played tennis uh, one time. Yeah, and- I've got a little story at the end of this program about all that, how we came to, to meet in the first place. But musically, all of that time that you were doing all of the, that history right there, I was nothing musically. I didn't. Uh, pick up a guitar until my senior year in high school, yeah. which would have been 71. And heck, that was about the time your mama quit managing yeah. y'all after five years of constant playing, you know. But what so, y'all did is y'all were pioneers here in Waycross. You and Billy Ray, y'all started the first country rock band. We did start Waycross. a band called Sweetbriar in yeah. 74, and that went through some personnel changes and uh, ended up as – homegrown when we hooked up with a lead singer in Valdosta, a front man, great lead singer by the name of Eddie Middleton. And he took, this is how the story associates itself through uh, twists and turns. Uh, Eddie Middleton took Randall Bramlett's spot in King David and the Slaves in wow. the sixties. Mm-hmm. Randall's, 
left the slaves and uh, went on his solo career, Eddie Middleton joined. And that's where the bass player for King David and the Slaves, Wayne Scarborough, another Waycross fella, uh, the two of them were, were close friends. And uh, by 76, Eddie was performing in Valdosta at his own little trio behind him. And one of the guys in his trio was leaving the band. And so he needed a new backup band. And he calls the old King David and Slaves bass player, Wayne Scarborough, up, who I was playing with at the time in Homegrown. He calls him up and says, man, I need a band and I need it now. <laughs> and, uh, and Wayne says, I got your band. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the five of us, John wasn't in, in the picture yet. So this was 70, uh, five in October of 75. Uh, we go to Valdosta and do a crash course on Eddie Middleton playing music that I had never played before in my life. And it felt good. It was so music. You're playing you know? guitar. I was playing mm -hmm. guitar, and uh, we had a lead guitar, Joe Shear, Wayne Scarborough on bass, Ricky Alderman on keyboards, young, young man. On, Still tenth, in high school? Uh, 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 twelfth, 12th grade. He was in his senior year of high school. And Bruce Wood on drums. And, I grew uh, up across the street from Bruce. Yeah, and Bruce was uh, the original drummer for Midnight Sun. Mm-hmm. Who, from the Battle of the Bands. From the Battle of the Bands yep. with the faux pas. And uh, uh, so the five of us start back, backing uh, Eddie Middleton in Valdosta at uh, the Holiday Inn. And we played two weeks there, and then we moved right across I-75 from the Holiday Inn was this beautiful, beautiful supper club. I mean, like something out of a Las Vegas dream. It had uh, it had this red velvet decadence. You know, the walls were covered with red velvet, and uh, and these. It was like a, a stage came out of the corner, and the half moon shape was about five feet off of the dance floor. You know, so you were up there, lording over the whole dance floor, and then you had the dance floor level tables and you walk up to the next level and they had a bunch more tables and then a bunch of these oyster shell looking seashell looking seats straight out of Las Vegas booths. Best sounding room I've ever oh played. Oh my in. God. Great it's sounding room. King of the road. Yeah. Motor lodge was, you, was the name of it. Me and you were playing somewhere over there. And we, you drove us through there. It was all shut down or whatever. Right. Yep. I took y'all through the old parking lot to show you. Mm -hmm. It was it was Roger Miller's baby. His uh, original uh, idea was to put up a chain of these across the United States. One wound up in Valdosta, and I wound up playing in it and, mm -hmm. in '75 with Eddie Middleton. We had that song, "King of the Road." King of the trailers road. for celery. Mm -hmm. And we had a wait mm -hmm. waitress there. Her name was Leanne, remember? <laughs> and Eddie would say, Leanne, 450 cents. <laughs> <laughs> She'd always yeah. shoot us a bird, you know, and say. <laughs> but, uh, well, so fast forward into uh, about, uh, let's see, we played 13 solid weeks straight, six nights a week from January through March or something like that, the King of the Road. And uh, our drummer left to go to Nashville, soon followed by our keyboard player. And they were both from Albany, Georgia. And uh, we cobbled together for a, a good month, uh, hiring musicians, hiring drummers from the, the local musicians' unions in Jacksonville or wherever we had a gig just a drummer by committee for a long time. And we were at, at, at just, where can we find a damn drummer who will stay with us, join the band and good enough to hang, you know? And, and <laughs> you walked in the door one afternoon. It was probably end of May and uh, 76. And uh, you came strolling in the door, just, 
despondent as hell. And uh, we, I remember we were downstairs about two, two or three in the afternoon. We were rehearsing, waiting on Eddie to get there. And we were learning a new song. And you, the door swung open and you walked in. And we all sat at the same time. Hell, there's our drummer right there. <laughs> and he <laughs> needed a job. And he needed a job. So it was just like, hell. So we got him up, uh, up on stage. Uh, I don't want to tell too much of my story that I'm going to read at the end of the show here. But anyhow, it happened so that uh, John was hired, and uh, he ended up working out. And and we had a five-piece band. We were all from Waycross mm -hmm. again. So that And I sang, a, too. I could throw in a harmony, you know. So it sing, worked out good. We have four right. people that would sing harmony, so. That worked out great. For and Eddie, Eddie was, you know? a, was one of the best showmen. That, oh, that we, I mean, we learned a lot. We went to the school of showmanship with Eddie Middleton. That's right. He taught us so much. He uh, did. It was like a, that was a, that was like a paradise gig for me because I heard about y'all and I had to apologize to the Dover Bluff band. Say, hey, listen, I can't turn this deal down. And, mm -hmm. and I felt bad because, you know, We'd got the, something going, and uh, I think I apologized ten times to him before. Bonnie keeps saying, "Quit apologizing for that. We're over it," you know. But I, I just read apologizing, <laughs> but you know, then then not just want to make sure I did it. But uh, but uh, it was two hundred dollars a week. Now that mm -hmm. was serious to me. Mm -hmm. I hooked my own hotel room and half price on drinks. I mean, what you know, what what better deal? <laughs> but what I got with these guys, man, they were playing all this funky music, and I love soul music. And that band really, more than anything, helped me become a more seasoned drummer because mm. we were a variety band. Mm -hmm. We played country, mm -hmm. Tom Jones, she's the lady. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not unusual. I had to Lou Ross had to learn a little bit of it all. And so that's what I like to tell new drummers or young musicians out there: play every kind of music you can. Mm -hmm. Don't don't tune anything out, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it's just gonna make you better in the long run. Mm -hmm. But Dave and Joe, they sit on the side over there to my left, and Wayne and Ricky, but they had mm -hmm. those double get rhythm guitars going. I said, man, that that sounds good, man. We were, <laughs> it, it was a good feeling. And, and that we, room sounded so good, oh, man. and. Uh, and Good Eddie group. just, you know. Eddie could have an audience. And we played all over the United States yep. for uh, 76, 70. Well, you were with us for about a year and a half. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then you left the band and started up with Bill again, your brother yep. Bill. Yeah. Y'all started another. Yeah, I started band. a band called Homeward Angel. Homeward Angel. But, and, but before we get to that, we, we got some more down home talking to do. Oh, my God. <laughs> that year and a half from the time you joined in May of 76, the very first gig you you and I traveled to it, too, because I spent the night with you the night before we left to go to Panama City. Uh, I spent the night at Evelyn's apartment. And we left out of there in my old gold Ford van with the engine cover, inside engine cover that uh, wouldn't latch down. It was and, blowing out and heat. blowing up. out heat in, <laughs> in June, mm. you know. And so here we were shirtless in cut-off jeans. And uh, we, I remember there was a, a, an ice chest at Evelyn's apartment in the shape of a beer mug, and the top of it was the foam. The top of the little styrofoam ice chest yeah. was foam, a little round foam that you put on. We, we, I think we took that thing with us in the van, and we stopped and got uh, a couple of six packs of beer on the way out of Aldosta. And about halfway to Panama City, we had to stop for more. But we were drinking the whole way down there, and I remember when it we was not non-alcoholic beer. No, we weren't DUI. Were we? We, <laughs> we? We was DUI all the way, and without shirts on, and and we got to that straightaway. It was my first trip down there. I don't know about you, but I'd I, never been there either. I'd never seen. We the, had, the we Gulf were of excited. We were drunk and excited, and I remember we hit that straightaway. We were close, and we were hanging out the window, <laughs> just. 
whooping and hollering. <laughs> Anyhow, when we pulled up to the uh, Sheraton on the beach was where we were to play for the next two weeks. And it was right there on the Gulf of Mexico. And we pulled up underneath that Sheridan on the beach dry, uh, entrance right there and saw that white sand and just blue water. It was just too much. I mean, we, I don't think I even shut the van off. We just piled out of there and went running and just – Jumped fell the into the fell into the ocean. Well, we were burning up, man. That yeah, old van we was hot. about to heat us to death. Yeah, we splashed around in that surf, just giddy. And, we got uh, out by the pool, and for some reason, we thought Jack we were Daniels. We first ones there. Yeah, we thought Jack Daniels would be a good idea to switch. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> needless to say, I got a little yeah, too much. The gig that night. <laughs> I about lost the gig, lost the job that night because I was too too inebriated to play. The Eddie said I sound like a baby splashing in a tub back there. <laughs> and so Wayne Scarver, God love him, he uh he talked to Eddie, said, no, Eddie said, we need to call Moy Harris. That's an old drummer. And Wayne slave, said, no, I'll, let me talk to him. So Wayne talked to him. He said, man, you can't show up like that. You know, we all drink a little bit, but you can't show up drunk, you know. <laughs> Telling a lot of my story here, people. Rule, hope y'all don't rules mind, of the road. But, uh, you see, you know, and then the, the truth is you guys, y'all had payments and, and two of the guys were married and, and yeah. their wives were on the road with us. Joe and, and Wayne were. To me, well, I wasn't as serious about it, but Wayne let me know we're serious about this. This is our job. We, we pay our bills with this and we can't go home to mom and dad. It's like you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I realized that and got more serious about you know, had to learn to be a little more professional, and mm -hmm. and I, but he saved my job that night. I'll never forget it. But. I was a little ahead of myself uh, when you joined the band. That did not make it five guys from Waycross quite yet. It was Pine Room. We had the the keyboard player in the band at the time that you joined was still from Albany, Georgia. His name was Lee Newell, and he he got the nickname. In Albany, there was this place called the Pine Room, and he played solo keyboards. You know, I can picture this guy sitting in a dim lidded bar room, you know, Le singing his ass off because he was a great singer. Yeah. And uh, uh, everybody just took to calling him around Albany. They just took to calling him. They'd see him on the street. They'd say, Hey, there goes Pine Room. Yeah. Pine Room. <laughs> named, named after the club. But you remember, in. he was supposed to leave after the first week, and he didn't want to leave because we were having so much fun down there. Well, it's Panama City Beach. My God. And Ricky just... was there to learn the parts. Ricky was going to transition back into the band because R Ricky had started with us in October 75, but he commuted he and Bruce Wood, our drummer, commuted every day, every single day of the week between October and December 31st. Mm -hmm. Because Ricky was still in high school. Bruce had a full-time job at Waycross Cable Company. And uh, and uh, it was killing them, you know. Uh, to six nights a week they had to play, but five uh, days of that was – Get up early, go to work, go to school, get out of school, get off work, haul ass to Valdosta, play a gig till two in the morning, yeah. haul ass back to Waycross, get up and do it again, you know? Mm. So uh, it was, uh, they, uh, he quit in December of 75 and said, guys, I'll be back as soon as I graduate high school. Yeah. And so the uh the, the keyboard player from Albany that replaced Ricky in January of 76 was was Pine Room Lee Lee Pine Room Newell and uh and he knew that he was leaving and Panama City was to be the transition point Ricky was there straight out of high school and sitting there right in front of the stage taking notes you know okay synthesizer on this song all right, organ, you know, <laughs> he's out there taking his notes. And for a week, it was to be that. And then the change would take place. Well, 
after that first week, I think we might have played uh, two or three weeks down there. Well, but, I think uh, it was three. Three weeks. Pine Room had got him a little bit of romance going down there. He wasn't wanting to leave. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, he was begging Eddie no, to let no, him stay. No. And Ricky's yeah. like, no, you know. Yeah. We had to let him go. He was this is another guy down I think there. Eddie had to have a talk, pull him to the side and say, no, no, Pine Room. <laughs> All things must pass. Uh, you, <laughs> you, you got a gig in Nashville. You go on to that gig now. But uh, yeah, and Ricky would go down there and practice. He, Ricky was a quick study too. I mean, you could he could he had a great, Ricky Alderman was amazing. He, he had a great ear. He'd hear something. He'd sit down and play. He played very much like Chuck Lavelle mm -hmm. uh, on the on the keyboards. Didn't play with curved fingers. He played with his fingers flat. You know, and he was he, he was he, good. He never uh, he learned strictly by ear. You know, never had a. I don't think he had any formal lessons. He, I, he might take some he might have taken a few, lessons, but, but he got his from. Uh, he'd go home every day and and gravitate to that upright piano sitting in the rec room of his house, and. Uh, but when he got there, I, I think to, the band was at its best. You know, mm -hmm. I really do. We, and I know the level of fun was was off the charts, especially me, you, and Ricky doing a lot of stuff together. We weren't married. And, yeah, yeah. and uh, we'd ride around and sing to the cows in the middle of the night. And, and uh, Yeah, we used but to. But we, we played some cool gigs, too, up in New York, up up in uh, Macon. We mm -hmm. we played uh, with Dickie Betts. He, he was mm -hmm. starting the great Southern band, and some executives from uh, uh, CBS Records were down to listen Steve to him. Steve Popovich. Yeah, to sign mm -hmm. him. And uh, he, uh, uh, Eddie got signed as sort of a southern country gentleman type, you know, Tom Jones meets country music. Had three chart singles on his debut album, Midnight Train to Georgia, What Kind of Fool, and Endlessly. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's kind of rare for a debut artist. But uh, he, uh, we were playing with Dickie Betts. And he got up on the stage and played One Way Out with us. And this is one of my mm. little things where it made me feel extra kind of special. So Dickie and Joe were playing guitar, and Dave let him play his guitar. I gave my guitar to Joe. Joe gave his sunburst Les Paul to Dickie. So Joe was our lead guitar player, yeah. not me. And they started playing. Yeah. I went, I went and out. sat down in the crowd and watched this take mm -hmm, place. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty dang I'm awesome. Well, I started up with a beat, and like I say, this is one of those things that made me kind of feel cool, but uh, I started to <laughs> the little beat there that they play on that, and old Dickie Betts, he, he looked over at me and goes, like, <laughs> They give you the improvement. He can say, he said, that's yeah, it. Yeah, that's I said, right. oh, man, I wanted to jump off my drums and just go hug him, you know, <laughs> which would have messed up the song. But, you know, <laughs> but that but, goes uh, back to yeah. your being grounded that uh, yeah, time. Being where grounded, you grounded. Where listen. you had the cough headphones on. Yeah. Try, listening to the Almond um, Brothers, which yep. had two drummers, and trying to be both of them. Yeah. So there you go. That's that's it. Paid pay, off. Being grounded gets paid pays mm -hmm. off. But <laughs> but we went out partying that night, and we went to this place called Hodges Barbecue, and that's where Red Hot Chicken, the Wet Willie song, Red Hot Chicken, was about Hodges Barbecue. Dickie Betts was there. He was dating. This was uh, uh, this was about. Four in the morning. Yeah. He was dating Cher's publicist, yeah. who looked like Cher. Looked just like Cher. Cher and Greg Allman were an item back then. And Dickie was driving a BMW? No, a, a brand new 450 SL Mercedes. Mercedes. He and that girl got in a fight. Of course, Dickie Betts was always getting drunk and getting, you know, getting in arguments and stuff. Uh, but he... He came out here, these old cowboy boots, and started kicking that Mercedes, you know, dents in it. And we're yeah. like, we were we were impressed by that, you know, back then. We thought that's a rock star. Yeah, yeah. But nowadays we'd be like, hey, dude, what you, what you doing, man? Calm down, man. <laughs> that's a nice car, you know. But uh, we were impressed by that. But uh, that night, earlier that night, we were in the motel room, and this guy named Sam Letterman, he was a, like a a and R guy or a lawyer for – uh, Epic Records up there. And that was the label that signed Eddie. Yeah. Was Cle Cleveland, Cleveland International. International was a city area yeah. of Epic. And he said, hey, guys, listen to this. He had this little <laughs> cassette recorder, 
He said, this is fixing to be the biggest thing you ever heard. And uh, we listened to it. He said, this guy's name Meatloaf. He's fixed to be the biggest thing. He's fixed to blow the top was, off the world. It was you know? a r rough mix. I can't imagine uh, and we couldn't why stand they were it. so proud of it. We were like thinking, with. this guy ain't going to do nothing, you know. And and next yeah. thing you know. Bad out of hell. Come sell seven million albums, you know, on his debut album. But we heard it where anybody <laughs> else did, you know. And it wasn't good on We put, we put a bad mouth on it. We were I, listening to it. It wasn't to, to it. us. Right. And, yeah. and I never have like. I never have. Well, I, I, I never. It's just that drop dramatic, you know, rock yeah. or whatever. But, uh, hey, uh, you know, those guys, they knew stuff that we didn't know, you know. It's just like when I was. I got a song published by Bill Lowry, and Dave and Billy Ray turned me on to Bill Lowry mm -hmm. later on. My brother Bill and I got some songs published. And I was playing this song. It's called Way Back When. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Lowry says, I really like that song. I want you to change this one word. Uh, and I said, I don't know. I kind of like that word. He said, "No, it'll make it'll it'll open it up more if you change it to this little." Is it? I'm arguing about a pronoun, you know, or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Bill Lowry. Bill Lowry. And he's, you know, and and I'm I'm being pretty committed to my word, and Bill Lowry's being very nice to him. He said, yeah. "Listen to it closely. If you change it to this word, by that time I started looking at all them platinum gold yeah. gold <laughs> records, you know, uh, all over the walls, and I got to thinking." John, just shut up, you know, and change the word. And, yeah. and he was right. When I, he, when I changed the word, it just opened it up, the meaning to bring in more meaning, you know, like a good song does. But mm -hmm. I'm sitting there arguing with a man with platinum albums on the wall about <laughs> a pronoun, you know. But, you know, you, you learn how to get humble in rock and roll, you know. And uh, we, we, we went through so many fun things. We would have band wars, you know, and – Rock and roll egos. It's it's funny. But. We just had some good times. We in, did in uh, uh, Eddie Middleton year year and a half. No, we played all over. We played Little Rock, Arkansas, and Chattanooga, uh, Nashville, uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. The Swingers Tent down the TPC. Oh, we played the GJO and the TPC, the golf professional golf tournaments in Jacksonville. The one night the tent, the tent came. Tent. The wind got under and it was poles were at, falling. At the TPC. Yeah. They put they moved uh, the the event from uh, Deerwood Country Club out to Sawgrass, and they put the Swingers Tent was where we played. They called it the Swingers Tent. After the 18th hole, um, that's when we'd kick off the party. You know, it was just long ass circus tent. Yes, and they had top. it staked down into the asphalt parking lot of of the uh, uh, a big uh, hotel on Jacksonville Beach. They put us up at Howard Johnson's mm -hmm. down the down the road there. But I remember we woke up. Well, we were still asleep from the night before playing the night before, and the phone rang way too early, and it was Wayne Scarborough saying, "Get up, <laughs> guys! You need to get up, and get down here right now." The wind, uh, <laughs> the uh, tent's wind, blowing the away. tent's blowing away, <laughs> and we had to haul oh, ass man. down there at ten in the morning, uh, uh, way too early, and uh, salvage our equipment. Uh, they got it under control, yeah. though. Tom Wills was interviewing Eddie, and uh, they Tom said, Wills is that great uh, Jacksonville Channel Four yeah. newscaster, the one that broke the Leonard Skinner plane crash story. Yeah. Oh. So you see him in all the documentaries. A young yeah. Tom Wills. He said he asked Eddie what happened, and and, and Eddie said. I think they edited it out. He said, well, the band that played here last night tore the roof off their sucker. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lord. Uh, yeah. Well, you remember they put me up in some kind of penthouse suite. I don't know how I ended up with a penthouse suite yeah. up there. And and everybody gone? come to my room, remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, was the I mean, room, that was the room we were in. Where yeah. The, oh, and y'all had yeah. regular motel rooms. But somehow I got it up a suite on the top floor. I never did call down the to the desk to tell them they may have made a mistake. I said, uh-uh, we're going to mm -hmm. ride this thing out. But And remember that pigeon flew in. Mm -hmm. I had my outfit laid out. Oh, yeah, we had a <laughs> press, you know, a, a 
these little white overalls or these little blue denim shirts kind of. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there telling a joke. We're having a beer, and everybody's laughing. Everybody's cutting up, a little pre-activity before the gig. The door's open, the Atlantic the, breeze uh, the, blowing uh, the in. The patio and, door was open. Yeah, the, the balcony door balcony was open. Door. A pigeon flies in the room. Or a seagull. Was it a seagull or a no, pigeon? No, it was a pigeon. Pigeon. Okay. It was a pigeon. Flew in my room, flew directly over my white outfit, and Damn. took a dump on it, purple, <laughs> a purple dump, and just flew right back out. And we no. all just kind of looked at each other like we would have had a hallucination or <laughs> hallucination or something. <laughs> Pitched our sense, did that really just happen? And, <laughs> and just this big old, and I, I've always interpreted that as a sign. You know, some kind of sign like, you know, you, 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 you need to do better or something. Or, 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 or maybe I was a pigeon in a former life and that was my ex wife pigeon or something. <laughs> but anyhow, I had to call Wayne and say, Wayne, we can't wear the outfit tonight. A pigeon flew in the wind and took a dump on my, my outfit. He uh -huh. had, ha, ha, hung up. You know, <laughs> We had to call back and say, no, man, for real. Here's Talk to Dave. He'll tell you it's the truth. You know? uh, Just one of the crazy things, you know. Yeah, which we had many. Speaking yeah. of one, I want you to tell the folks out there um, – you know, you being a big fan of uh, the Almond Brothers and everything, uh, the drummers of the Almond Brothers was, was Butch Trucks and uh, J. Johnny, Johnny, J. J. Johnny, Johnny Johansson. Johansson, yeah, uh, whose nickname at the time was J-Mo. And uh, one night we were playing a, a, a gig in, in uh, Jacksonville, I guess. It was at uh, Sunny's Lake Forest Lounge. Yep, staying at the Rain Tree Inn. We were staying at the yep. Rain Tree Inn on I-95, and it was early in the morning after the gig. And uh, we was uh, sitting in somebody's room, me and you and Ricky and Eddie, it was I believe. It adjoining room. Yeah. Remember, I was in one room. So it was, it was a good four o'clock in the morning once again and we were still imbibing and you got real philosophical and uh you was kind of slurring and, and uh and <laughs> kind, of, kind, kind of sleep <laughs> like you came out of a sleep because great you, wisdom just couldn't remember you had been, day, you had you know? been quiet and and you just all of a sudden you piped up and you said i want a nickname I want a nickname. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you said, from now on, I want y'all to call me. And you paused and you said, Jabbo. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we didn't think a whole lot of them, you know. <laughs> well, the next it, day, though, uh, when, when it was a takeoff on J Mo, that's J -Mo. what inspired right, me. J -Mo. He, had, he had J Mo. I want to be Jabbo. Jabbo. And, and yeah. uh, so the next day, you know, we went to bed that night and got up, started going to lunch, what have you, and making our you know, daily rounds, and everybody was calling you Jabbo. I'm like, well, why are y'all calling me that, man? They, they had <laughs> explained to me what happened, but... But, but it stuck. Yeah, with, it stuck. You with know, me was, and even my son Connor called. Yeah, he you called that. me Jabbo. Not not many people know that story, no. which is why, I'm afraid why you told it on this podcast. It, 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 I'm gonna, a lot of people gonna be calling me Jabbo. Well, <laughs> I will respond to that because I'm I, to. I, but y'all cut it short to jab, you know. Jab, and, yeah. and, uh, but the, you know the funny fun thing. Story. Funny thing about that is that uh, afterwards, I started seeing. Uh, references to the name, the actual name of Jabbo Smith. Yeah, a in, uh, jazz player. Uh, yeah. it, and I believe he might have been from Waycross. What? A trumpet player by the name of Jabbo Smith might have that? come from Waycross, too. But there were two I ain't Jabbo sure Smiths on that. Two Jabbo Smiths. But that's funny because <laughs> you, you played trumpet in the high school marching band. Yeah, if we'll remember that uh, – that, uh, uh, Band we ran to Chattanooga, you know they would they they their bands were named, was named was, Jabbo, you know, or, or is on the on the Jabbo label on the Jabbo label, yeah, something new. But yeah, I, I always thought it's pretty ourselves. cool. I always thought it's pretty cool that uh, I was able to 
I think I was destined to get into music, you know. I, I ended up being a school teacher. I think that's where the good Lord wanted me. But, you know, uh, uh, we did have some action with uh, Homeward Angel. We were actually offered a record deal with CBS Records. Uh, the guy, uh, uh, Lenny Pizzi, mm -hmm. and our manager at the time was Hugh Rogers. He managed Mother's Finest. B.J. Thomas, mm -hmm. the producers, and and uh, but you know he wanted a two album deal, and you know so now, the name of that story is almost famous. <laughs> in <laughs> but, this group, this is uh, you left uh, Down Home Band, which we had changed our name from Homegrown yeah. to Down Home Band with yeah. Eddie Middleton, yeah. and we had that run there with John or Jabo. As you prefer, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Captain Captain he, John Smith, Captain John, yeah. and Captain Captain, <laughs> is it raining? Or are you, <laughs> uh, um, John left in uh, 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 late seventy seven, and uh, yeah, and Ricky stayed with us for mm, a few more weeks, mm -hmm. and then our keyboard player Ricky left. And y'all put together Homeward Angel, and we replaced y'all and carried on with Down Home yeah. for about 10 more months. Yeah. Uh, but Homeward Angel, no, Shadow Facts. Well, we 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 were named Shadow Facts very short. We never played a gig. Okay. But that was, that was the name of Gandalf's horse from The yeah, Hobbit. From The Hobbit, yeah. And uh, Bill Ferris, who's done very well in the music business, he's, I think he works with Brad Paisley right now. He's worked with... He's Leanne Rhymes. Leanne Rhymes, uh, uh, in the production side of it. Uh and uh but anyhow, we we had to get rid of that name. So we named ourselves after the novel Look Homeward Angel by Thomas Wolf, a mm -hmm. uh, Southern writer. Homeward Angel. And that kind of stuck. But that that's that probably the best original band I was ever in. We were writing you were songs, the first you know? uh, personnel in that band when, when it, it was Bill, built. my brother Bill, yeah. Ricky Alderman, Bill Ferris, and me. Okay. And then Bill left because he just couldn't deal with the craziness in the, our right. household, you know. That's right. And we had this crazy band house and uh and then uh six oh one East Moore. Six oh one East Moore, <laughs> W C Fields, remember W C <laughs> But uh, I lived there for a while. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. We scared Dave with Harley <laughs> Davidson one night. He still having nightmares of a Harley Davidson coming I'll into his never bed. Never live but, over that. Get but, over uh, that. The uh, our next two guitar players were Pat Buchanan, who's a great session player in Nashville. He's played with everybody. He's, he's done an album with Hall and Oates, Trisha Yearwood. He's like been musician of the year a couple of times up there. Mm -hmm. And another guy named Bob Beckwith. Now those guys, we could sing, but those guys could really sing. And we, mm -hmm. so we had those two lead singers, and that kicked us up a notch. And, uh, and our songwriting was getting better too, you know. And both of them were lead guitar players. Both of them could play guitar. Lead. I mean, immaculate. And they guitar. they were good. We 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 played some cover songs here and there, some Toto and stuff like that. But we really started uh, playing. Uh, uh, Better music and more thought out. I was sober. I, I put that stuff behind me, and uh, and we we were getting pretty good. And and uh, uh, and Bill Bill Ferris and I we we were no longer lead singers, which I was glad. I never have thought myself as a lead singer, but I could harmonize, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, and we we started doing pretty well. Played here and there, did some showcases. Uh, I came off the road with the band. It was just getting a little too crazy. The environment was a little too crazy for me, and I just had to. I thought I was fixing to, you know, to start going down the, the wrong path again. But, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, came back to Waycross, got married, got a regular job. Mm -hmm. Then you and I started down home again, or that's the, right, yeah. the Keepers, and me and you and Joe, and then Napoleon. Yeah, we that started uh, down home again, in, in about. Uh, 82 mm -hmm. and uh and and ran that for a couple of years and then in 85 we started the keepers yeah and uh covered nothing but 60s songs yeah our, our 
idols. It was real popular then. It was. Kind of, you know, you have every what 25 happens, years. Yeah, every 20 or 25 years, you have these folks that graduate. Yeah. And then 20 years, they've got good jobs and they can throw parties, <laughs> yeah. invite all their friends, you know, mm -hmm. and rent nice places. And they want what they listen to at high school. But I think right? I read somewhere so, that every 20 or 25 years, yeah. something becomes In a vote. classic. Right. You know, vote, whatever you know, happened. 25 years earlier is now classic. Right. So, uh, and they were playing a lot of that on classic rock at the time, you know, 60s. So we were one of the first around here doing that. To do that, yeah. yeah. And we had so much fun in that band. We did. That band, though, although you left in, in that group, and I didn't stay long either. It started in 85, and I left in 89. You left before that. Uh, we replaced you with Gary Brown, mm -hmm. who was another good uh, local Musician from I thought I'd turn that later off. on. Y'all hired uh, Rita McDaniel to sing. Yeah, and she's a great. Uh, I think singer. she came on board after I left. Yep, and uh, and uh, then later on after that day, they carried on for like they seventeen years. Or yeah, so. they were a long range band. Mm -hmm. Then you but, and I, we Dave and I, and my brother Bill, we started a Southern Heritage band. We were singing old music from the. Civil War era. My daddy kind of put that band together. We did songs that were popular back then. 1800s and, yeah, folk songs. Yeah, and, and uh, we were kind of like an Americana band and and started writing songs and selling CDs. And that Had a would, good little run with that, too. Well, those were, Very some popular. Of, those were some of our best original songs. You can listen to them on Reverb Nation. Uh, but, that started in, in the early 90s, about the same time mm -hmm. that I hooked up with uh, Billy Ray Heron. Yeah. And we started getting some songs published with Bill Lowry, the Lowry Group. Yeah. And that, R Billy Ray opened up the door for all of us he around did. here. And then you and Bill got four songs published with him, with them. And uh, today, all of our songs sits in a publishing company in California called the Bicycle Music Group. Do they? I was yeah. wondering where those songs were. I knew Sony yeah. Music bought when, them out. When Lowry died, his children sold the catalog to Sony in Nashville, and they set up there uh, not doing a damn thing. Are our contracts even any? Are they still? I'm you know, pretty sure out? the songs belong to us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I couldn't swear to it though. I had a song I, think I there wrote. There might be a twenty-five year thing in that too. With it. I had a song I wrote called "Sweet Tooth." It's kind of bubblegummy, and I I, used, I played it at the Pierce County High School Talent Show. I just they wanted me to do something, so I was saying "Sweet Tooth." Got a sweet tooth, baby, and I want to bite into you. Got a <laughs> sweet tooth, mama. Nothing but your sugar will do, you know. But <laughs> but my first. My first lyrics were kind of, you know, a little vulgar. And Mr. Lowry said, you, can you tone this down a little bit? You know, I don't know if we'd play that on the radio. So mm -hmm. I, I changed some of the wording yeah, where yeah. it wasn't quite so vulgar <laughs> and got it where it's acceptable. And he published it. And I remember my wife called me up at Pierce County. She said, your song got published by Mr. Lowry. And I was like, wow. hey. And I was always <laughs> grateful to Dave and Billy Ray for opening that door for me. And then we got three more published. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, David hadn't made us one dime. No, that's what I'm In saying. In fact, we've only spent money trying to make them. But that's yeah. okay. Maybe somebody. But I still have kids nowadays from Pierce County. They said, Mr. Smith, you still got that sweet tooth? <laughs> I said, yeah, I still got it. But they remember the song. You know? uh -huh. But it's uh, it's kind of, it's it's nothing real deeper. That's for sure. But Well, after the Rebel Airs, Okay, I remember we were coming home from a uh, a gig, and and uh, it was by this time it was around two thousand two or so, and uh, the gigs were becoming less and less frequent yeah. for for the Southern Heritage Group that we were in, and we were all coming. Coming into Waycross that day, driving my van from a gig, and we looked around at each other and we said, "Well, doggone, everybody in this band has played uh, 
cover songs in the past, you know. I mean, we played rock and roll, we played Beatles, we yeah. played everything in our histories, except for the bass player who had not had as much experience yeah. on stage. But uh, we uh, decided at that point, let's, uh, since the gigs are slowing down with this band, let's put a top 40 band, uh, an old, a cover band, a classic cover band back together. Where everybody's wanting us to come play for free. We like, man, we, I was poor by there. So I need to make some money, man. I don't need mm. no free gigs, you know? But yeah. That's, so that's when we came up with the idea for the last band that we were a Rhythm part of Oil. was Rhythm Oil. Yeah, and Dave named, came up with that name. Named right? after the Stanley Booth yeah. book, the author that wrote uh, The True Adventures of the Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. Stanley, you you know who I'm talking about. Stanley Booth, folks, look him up. He was one of the great, great writers. Uh, uh, that blues, was a long run, blues, though. Rhythm God, yeah. almost what Rhythm twenty Oil. years or something. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. It's long run. It was almost twenty years. I, I think we decided to disband about four years ago. We played a yeah. lot of weddings around here. We got a lot yeah. of people married and played a lot of dances. We that was our emphasis was. Play music they dance to. Mm -hmm. Kind of went back to the Eddie Middleton. Yep. Because that's what they want to do at wedding receptions and stuff. But anyhow. Uh, well, we certainly had a, a history of, uh, of, of, of music. Uh, a lot of different bands. Uh, of course, you, you played in uh, many bands before uh, I even started, but. Together, we've played in mm -hmm. four or five groups. He even and played one gig with Jack Cadillac at the Graham Parsons Little Nights. I did. We, I did. we showed up without a drummer, and he said, I'll play <laughs> yeah. drums for you boys. Well, we, we, I, I was, that's fun. Those those shows are fun, the ones that Dave put on. You got Swamp Town Get Down. Oh, that's the other up. thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this actually, weekend, right? Actually, by the time this is on there, it will be, it over. will be history. But, uh, um, y'all have heard us talk many times on these podcasts about the, uh, the Grand Parsons guitar pool and the Swamp Town get down the two festivals that I put on here in Waycross, uh, uh should, uh, make it a point to come sometime. Yeah. They are a lot of fun. There's another band that we didn't even mention, Hickory Wind. Yep. That was our local, uh, sort of hybrid band with me, you, Billy Ray Heron. Tony Kaysen, Steve Glisson, and my brother Bill. But the very first. Had George Farr in it also. First yeah. band had Ronnie Griffin on bass. Yep. Debbie Thigpen on vocals and uh, George Farr on keyboards. Yep. And uh, it came about, Hickory Wind is probably Graham Parsons' most uh, signature song, you know, uh, that he wrote. And uh, it became. Uh, the name of our group and when when the local chamber of commerce decided to pay tribute to graham and during uh in 1991 during our annual pogo fest celebration see waycross not only has graham parsons to be uh ashamed of, i mean proud <laughs> of <laughs> But they uh, they became ashamed of him briefly there uh, after the book came out. But uh, and Billy Ray had a record store called Sin City. <laughs> yeah, Billy Ray here, of course, everybody knows is the authority on Graham's life yep. in Waycross, his history here as a child growing up. But uh, he had his first record store back in the early seventies called Sin City. Named after the Flying Burrito Brothers. That went over big with the local Some. ministerial association. <laughs> no, yeah. the ministerial association and the uh, <laughs> uh, the city fathers. They didn't. Uh, yeah. They didn't think too much of that. When you go down to get your uh, business license and you tell them the name, <laughs> yeah, they, they went for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't go for it. In fact, they said they had a meeting one time. And they said. Uh, this is the first thing people see coming into our fair city from the east. Uh, 
is a big sign saying Sin City <laughs> 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 Records. <laughs> so they had a they had a heart to heart with Ray, and he changed it to uh, uh, Happy Sack. Happy Sack, Happy. <laughs> which was worse. Emmy Lou, <laughs> Emmy Lou Harris. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it depends on how you look at it. Slight reference there. Yeah. It was uh, Emmy Lou Harris. Uh, Brian uh, was married to Brian Brian Ahern or Brian Ahern, however you pronounce it, and that was the name of his uh, company. Was that Happy Sack Productions? Now we played. Uh, we played with some really cool artists. Uh, oh, we backed up Percy Sledge. We backed twice. up Percy Sledge. Uh, we saw um, Percy Sledge almost get in a fight with Alan Walden, uh, Phil in, Walden's in, uh, brother, and Macon. And Uncle Sam's well, and Macon. Percy that's wasn't right. wanting to fight. He, this guy was being belligerent, but it was Alan him. Walden yeah. who was drunk and yeah, he, pushing he, his he, finger in Percy's nose. Poor old Percy, he was just—he was just as humble, and he, he didn't—he didn't bite. He didn't. But we played. Uh, Lord, we got to meet Bernie Ledden from the Eagles, right mm-hmm. here. In oh Red yeah, Cross, yeah. At the at the Graham Parsons Guitar Pool, uh, which uh, Lord is being its twenty fourth year this he year. He liked me and you for some reason. I think because we had white hair or something. But uh, who Bernie? Bernie Ledden, you know he he's. Not well, he right. was he was he was not a happy camper. Yeah. Until the gig was over with, yeah. I mean, he pissed a lot of people off, you included. Yeah, he was. He kind had of some short with some people that night, but just mm-hmm. derogatory things to say. He's putting his two fingers in my yeah. chest. I was running sound. He's like, "You the monitor boy." He called John Monitor. Said, I'm running monitors, but I ain't your boy. <laughs> <laughs> say, say, you don't like what you hear? Well, yeah. wait, uh, yeah, wait, wait, wait till the next set. <laughs> why do y'all got all these? Why you got the power up front? Not in whatever it was. Yeah. And uh, his brother played the. He, his his brother's set was the set before that. I said, well, your brother wanted everything moved, and now I got to move it back, but. Yeah, anyway, he's Marty Stewart. I, I would have to say, I think the best band I've ever heard. Yes, oh, at God. the Grand Parsons uh, guitar pool was Marty Stewart and the Fabulous Man. Superlatives. Superlatives. Yes. They were after them. After they got through playing, and we didn't have our best night that night. But after them, I said, "I'm never getting on this stage again." <laughs> they were <laughs> so good. They opened up with, "I know you, Ryder." Mm-hmm. Old Grateful Dead song. Mm-hmm. God, they were just God. They were killing. They were awesome. Yeah, everybody mm-hmm. got to meet one of their heroes here. But yeah, the Boyer and Talton came down. From Boy, Cowboy. Scott Boyer, Tommy Talton. Yeah, some, they've uh, had some great artists here. Ralph Stanley. Ralph Stanley. What Ralph you Stanley. Say? Charlie Lou. Charlie Lou. Kentucky Headhunters. Firefall. Firefall. Leon Russell. Leon Russell. Hey, living uh, legend. Guy from. Uh, um, two, uh, Uncle Tupelo, J. Farrar, yeah, uh, Jim White, Ian Dunlop. Every year, Graham's original International Submarine Band bass player. Mm-hmm. It's just been a good time, folks. Yeah. We've we've and we've shared uh, in all those good times on all them stages through the years and. We're going to take a little short break right now and come back and do an original song that uh, John Randall Smith wrote. And if we can remember it. If we can remember it. We'll be right back. Something in my brain won't let me stray. Something in my veins going to find its way. Something in the water taught me how to pray. Hey y'all, welcome back to Something in the Water podcast. Uh, John, what about this song that you wrote here? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, this song uh, came off our third uh, album from the Rebel Airs, and it basically describes uh, all the reasons why we like the South. And, uh, and just about anybody who comes down here, why they fall in love with the uh, 
Southern hospitality and all that kind of stuff. It, it was written in a very short amount of time. It's almost like I just needed to write it out there. But these are all the reasons why I love our homeland and why I hope y'all may love it too. It's called Dixie Land. All right. From the Rebel Ears. I love my home in Georgia. I love my home way down in Dixie Land. No doubt about it, there's no better place to live. When you try Southern living, I know that soon you surely understand. Down south in Dixie, we've got so much love to give. Dixie Land sings to Sing me softly to sleep Making me dream so sweet Dixieland lives in me We got the best kind of people We got the best hospitality in the world Barbecues and dances and the music plays all day all the gentlemen greet you Man, you've got to see those southern girls In the land of cotton You can pick out your own way Dixieland sings to me Sing me softly to sleep Making me dream Dixieland sings to me, singing me softly to sleep, making me dream so sweet. Dixieland lives in me. Dixieland, come on down. All right. After all that talking y'all did, I thought y'all was going to play something. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that was great. That was a great song. I always like to hear you guys harmonize, and that was good songwriting. Thanks, y'all. Thank nice buddy. chords and stuff, you know. You said you said you wrote that on guitar? Yeah, yeah. I wrote it at my kitchen table. It just kind of came out, one of them songs, you know, that just kind of. That's a good one. It seemed to be already written. John's somewhere. like those many, many drummers who also play guitar. He's he's written some some really good songs just sitting there with guitar and showing us the chords you know later showing us all of us the guitar players the drummer is showing us the chords but too. I, I can't name the them though I just, <laughs> yeah but you that's the beauty of it not knowing it uh you you're able to just hear something that sounds good and and it's like damn where'd you get that chord from that's pretty cool now now well that song to one to me when i heard hear that I think the melody had to be there first, and then you f figured out what chords go behind them. Or is it, am I, I wrong? I by think it was kind of a melody-driven song. I do, I do, you know. I think it's that's kind of where it started. Yeah, with a melody. You know, some songs that start with a melody. Sometimes you got a good riff, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or or a chorus. I had. An amazing melody to it, so I just assumed that came first. It did, it did. Think so. Well, folks, it's time once again for another tale of the week from Uncle Dave Griffin. That's me. And uh, this week, 
for this episode's tale of the week is talking about my good buddy right here in the hot seat is I have a good friend named John Randall Smith. He's walked down this road with me for many a year as a fellow bandmate, songwriter, counselor, prankster, and dear close friend. John Smith, so common a name to be attached to so uncommon an individual, an individual possessing a vast array of personalities. Schizophrenic? Nah. There's not any psychological discrepancies in this guy. His mind is not controlled by some alter ego. In fact, most often, John Smith is controlling the minds of those around him with his ability to educate and entertain. I'm convinced that this is what he does best through no matter which mantle he assumes. Musician, comedian, teacher, father, grandfather, or friend. I first met John on a side street in Waycross in 1970. In fact, it was right there behind the Pizza Hut on one of those roads coming up to Plant Avenue there. I was driving home from high school in the old Ford station wagon. I just turned 16 and was old enough to drive. And I came up behind a young man walking with long hair, fatigue jacket, and trumpet case in hand. I stopped and asked him if he needed a ride. He hopped in. First thing that struck me was, damn, he looks like Fast Parker <laughs> at 13. <laughs> uh, for any of you youngsters that don't know, Fest Parker was the actor who played Davy Crockett in the early TV show. And uh, then and about a decade later, he played Daniel Boone on a, uh, in Living Color. And uh, the next time we met, we were on a tennis court in Monroe Park. Me and my buddy, Bruce Cernsey, were already warmed up and welcomed all comers for a casual game of doubles. Well, John and his pal, Randy Conley, proceeded to intimidate my red-headed, short-tempered partner off the court with a volley of excellently placed shots along with a sardonic display of sass mouth unheard of in the gentleman's game of tennis. <laughs> Till John McEnroe. <laughs> <laughs> Till John McEnroe came along. That's, they'd be on the other side of the court saying, Ready, Eddie? And, Serve, Merv. <laughs> and just went on and on like that, taunting, unrelenting. Uh Four years passed by before I saw John Smith again. Damn, he looks just like Fess Parker at 18. <laughs> it was 1975, and I was playing with Eddie Middleton in the down-home band. John was drowning in the dregs of his latest musical experiment, Space Gnome, which was falling apart as his older brother Bill left to pursue college at Valdosta State. We were playing in the Red Room at the King of the Road Motor Inn on a Tuesday night when John stumbled down the steps. Decked out in a blue silk cowboy shirt, Levi's, and a pair of size 11 pointed toe cowboy boots, or as he referred to them, my chain link fence climbers. <laughs> Tony Llama boots. <laughs> they were Tony, Tony I think, Llama boots. I think so. They were pretty. They were nice. Give me a cold beer, said he to the waitress. The southern drawl was still there as he took a table directly in front of the stage. Eddie Middleton was wrapping up the evening with a soul-stirring rendition of She's a Lady by Tom Jones, followed by Bruce Chanel's Hey Baby, a favorite among the college frat prepsters who were so much a part of Eddie's world. On numerous occasions, I used to hear Eddie rant about the fly-by-night pseudo-intellectual weekend hippie types who took the steam out of the beach music scene, replacing it with psychedelic rock and mind-altering substances. Enter John Smith into Eddie Middleton's realm. <laughs> hey, man, y'all sound pretty good. How about buying me a cold beer? I know as much money as you make, you can buy me a cold beer. <laughs> Eddie, Eddie was not impressed. No. And it was to John's advantage that his kidneys react before Eddie did and, and 
rendered him out the rear door of the King of the Road to relieve himself. A few minutes later, Eddie, along with our bass guitar player Wayne Scarborough and his wife, Ann, exited the lounge en route to their motel rooms for the night, only to find John Smith peeing at the moon. By May of 1976, Eddie Middleton and Down Home Band were faced with a dilemma. Our most recent drummer, Mark Yarborough, had left the group and headed to Nashville as an aspiring songwriter. It was the onset of the summer season and was destined to be a very lucrative one at that. We needed a drummer badly. So we were practicing one afternoon downstairs in the Red Room Lounge, waiting on Eddie Middleton to arrive when, lo and behold, John Smith ambled into the room. We all looked up from the stage at the same time. There's our drummer right there. We asked him up and threw everything we had at him, including the syncopated, slightly stuttered beat of the Ohio player's skin tight. He nailed them all. Then Middleton arrived. No, (laughs) hell no, (laughs) absolutely not. John Smith will not play drums in my group, he screamed at Wayne. (laughs) T. Wayne, calm and business as usual, proceeded to conduce Eddie into agreement. Wayne said, beside the fact that we really need a drummer, he sings a breathy falsetto and plays his ass off. (laughs) Reluctantly, Eddie conceded, well, I suppose we can try him out, but I'm warning him. He knows he's not one of my favorites. (laughs) <laughs> Two nights later, on stage at the King of the Road, Eddie Middleton reverently and lovingly referred to John Randall Smith as my godson. A beautiful <laughs> relationship had begun. <laughs> oh, man. Hey. That's nice. You know, I was just talking to Eddie the other day on the phone. You know, Really? He's, yeah, he's uh, – we, we were we were messaging, you know, on Facebook. And, yeah. Uh, we've talked on the phone too, but he's uh, – He's on dialysis now, and he's kind of he, – we're, we're talking about getting together a little oh, man. reunion. I talked to Ricky. Ricky's in, and I know be Wayne great. will be in, and I know you'll be in. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Joe. Get with I Joe. Yeah. We can get Joe involved, too. Joe doesn't sing much anymore, but he still plays well. Uh, well, we just – I know we're not going to – but I think it would be something that – we would be sad if we didn't. I'm oh, gonna we'll bring my guitar. Song, I'm gonna bring man. my guitar with with us to that. Yeah, sing a, and, uh, and my box guitar, and uh, and uh, something will come up. Yeah, that was <laughs> that sure. was a fun band. Uh, yeah, Eddie taught me so much, and uh, you guys did too. Cause that that's a band where I kind of I had to switch and start being more professional. You know yeah. what I mean, and the, and that helped me a lot. I, I just had I couldn't just get up and sing whatever, I, you know, do whatever I felt like doing anymore. So you had to. Well, by the time, yeah. Or or it was after you got in the band, after Ricky got in the band. Um, that's when we started getting into the matching outfits. Yeah. I think it was after we saw Explosion. Yeah. Down in Panama City, they were playing at the Breakers. Yeah. Those and guys after so we, after our gig ended at, at Sheraton, we usually would hit, there was this arcade down there called Funland that served beer and corn dogs and, you know, just grill food and had, had pinball machines and all kinds of, you know, brightly colored neons and everything. <laughs> We'd wind up at places like that drinking the rest of the night, you know, and, uh, and but this place, this was this, this other club up the strip was high energy show band. And there was this band in there from Atlanta, I believe they're based out of Atlanta called explosion. And they exploded. Taught, taught they us. Good, they, good. they cleaned our plate. Well, after the, after we saw them, you know, there's always somebody that challenges you and makes you better. Mm-hmm. Just like Dwayne always made Dickie better, yeah. and, but this band, we said, "Oh, we got to get to the woodshed because <laughs> these guys, if we want to play these kind of gigs, you know." So mm-hmm. it really inspired us. They play Earth, Wind, and Fire, just a five piece, and they would, ooh, kill it. 
Mm-hmm. But they, they did. They, they made a difference and made us rethink everything. And then we started, uh, we started playing like a band, more like a band. And we started looking more like a band because then we'd, every time we'd go downtown, there used to be these two soul clothing stores right in the middle of downtown Valdosta called the Fly Shop and uh, the famous store. The famous store. <laughs> it was cool right there on Ashley. Man. On Polyester, Ashley Street. Man. Oh man, there was the, the racks was just lined with shoe uh, clothes, shirts, pants, shoes, the whole outfit. And there would be uh, a, a, a crap load of uh, all same shirt in different sizes and stuff. It was perfect. Yeah, for what we were doing. For yeah. what we were doing. And it wasn't expensive. Either. No, we, and we'd go to the fly shop in the famous store when we was home. Then we'd find these stores when we'd be playing in these other towns out on the road, you know. Did you ever, did you ever play and uh, you are all dressed alike and then somebody shows up wearing the same outfit? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be cool. And he gets free drinks all the night because the night, they think he's in the band. Oh, Lord. We had uh, it was funny. Uh, <laughs> Wayne was like the 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 manager of yeah. the group. Uh, he the coordinator, you know. Uh, he would, and of course, he was he was a good uh, six years older than yeah. me and Joe, and eight years older than you, and about nine years older than Ricky. He did a great job too. He, he did he had a certain kind of maturity about him that we. We were working on, but he... He was good on stage, on the mic, too, as mm-hmm. far as talking to the people, but there wasn't nobody like Eddie. Eddie was just, like, I mean, amazing, you know. We could just stand in his shadow and not say a word, and everybody would love us, you know. Yeah. And he'd do, do all of the work. We'd go show up in Little Rock, Arkansas, where we didn't know a soul, opening night, you know, and and it's like, Boom, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, whatever. The lights come on, and there's all these people out there, and they're looking at us. and And Eddie's the man, you know. He he just good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and well, you know, he just thirty seconds. He'd have him eating out of That's right. out of the palm of his hand. It was great. But Wayne used to call us in the afternoons. We'd be at in in the room, you know. And he'd he'd call up and he'd say. Jungle suit. We had names for our outfits. Jungle. The jungle suit. Uh, pinstripes. Uh, peach. <laughs> Overall. <laughs> Overalls. Stripes. Did anybody show up wearing the wrong one? No. We, no. we kind of knew what they meant, and, you know, but we, you know. Now, Eddie, I mean, uh, Ricky, our keyboard player, Ricky Alderman, hated the overalls. These overalls were tight in the crotch mm-hmm. i mean <laughs> yeah, yeah. and 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 they they just push push up real <laughs> tight when you when you <laughs> strapped in them <laughs> and he'd, he'd be oh man because <laughs> <laughs> it hurt him <laughs> oh lord hey. uh, yeah it, dearly we had some some great great times well, folks, we hope that y'all have enjoyed this episode. We thank you, John, for yes for sharing a lot of a uh, uh, history and uh, that kind of happened to me too. I, oh, yeah. I've enjoyed walking back, but I've also enjoyed hearing uh, about your personal history before we started playing together, and uh, I'm sure everybody out there enjoyed this as well. Y'all could do, y'all could do another round of this. Y'all have so many stories. We got uh, well, a lot I'm, of stories. Yeah, I'd love to do is if we are ever fortunate enough to have that down home reunion, is try to pile some of them yeah. or oh, all man. of them into that here. That would be too could, good. That would if be we too could good. figure that out. Oh Lord God! I had fun in a lot of bands, but that down home with Ed Milton, I had the most fun with that band. Uh, kind of at the end of that band, I kind of was crashing and burning, but I had the most fun with that band. Nobody had to tell us how to have fun. Mm-hmm. We didn't have cell phones, <laughs> internet, nothing. We just get in that van, pop a CD in there. Well, we didn't have CDs, pop a cassette in there. And 
But yeah, I appreciate Man. you having me, and uh, you know we are. Uh, I uh, I, I still love my music. Got me a nice set of Ludwig drums, and uh, and uh, I sit there and play at the house mostly. Every now and then, somebody will call me up to play. But you know, a friend of mine, you know, I, I always wanted to be a rock and roll star, you know, and and I never became one. And that was kind of a letdown to me, you know. I struggled with that, and I knew that forces were guiding me toward working with young people. I didn't find out till I started doing that for a while, but. Oh, Johnny Davis, he said, you know, my definition of success in music is if you play music and it makes people happy, that's a success. Mm -hmm. You know, I ain't getting rich with the money or anything, but I think musicians, if they have that as their greater goal, mm -hmm. instead of about look at me, look at me, if they say, hey, I'm playing a beat that's making them people move, Mm -hmm. I'm playing a song, whether one, the, the great songs you two write, y'all the best around here. If it touches mm -hmm. somebody's heart, then that's a big success, man. Mm -hmm. So we, we've got our little niche in the world. It's down here in Way Cross. And, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I heard Hollis, she, is it Shepard? Mm -hmm. Yeah. On Amazon Music, the, man. The new thing. Yeah, yeah, the new thing. I, I, we were going through this. Hey, that's, that's a Dave singing. It's you singing, right? About my name is yeah. Hollis Shepard. Yeah, yeah, on the, yeah. the my name is Hollis Shepard, yeah. Yeah, my son was in the back seat and said, Dave sounds good, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. The New Fingers, if y'all hadn't heard the New Fingers, y'all need to yeah. check out. You talk about a great <laughs> project band. Check them out. But thank y'all for having me. Yeah, man. Enjoy. Words of wisdom <laughs> from another one of Waycross's finest. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, John. We appreciate having you. Folks, next time we're going to bring the drums in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Enjoy it. And uh, thank you all for watching again. Please be sure to uh, rate and review, subscribe, like, all those bells and whistles, and uh, um, send us an email at our uh, new email address, something to the water podcast at gmail.com. Yes, sir. See you next time. Just my